kind of information that we're talking about now. So if I don't say metadata too much, you'll be pleased to know. <laughs> but it's just looking at why we're actually having this conversation and, and how we'll be using some of this information or the experience of talking about it in the future when we have to start depositing our digital archives a bit more regularly. Um, the project is a HE funded project. It's uh, been delivered by Big Ventures. I work with Big Ventures but have been involved as well with the Archives Project for a long time. Um, and it's really something to be seen alongside the um, CEPA Selection Toolkit, which has recently been launched and is available. And it's creating up-to-date guidance for everybody that's working with digital materials about how that material should be treated as an archive product, both within the Working Project Archive and then within the archaeological archive, which is the one that we're keeping forever and ever and ever. Hopefully, if we can get this sorted out. Um, so what it actually does is highlights the CEPA, the relevant CEPA standards. And I think it's really important to note that we're not creating <laughs> new standards and we're not asking people to do stuff um, that's different than the expectation that was already in place. The CEPA standard has been there for a long time, it's just that our methods and our means of doing archaeology have changed as digital technology has become more embedded in the process. So we're trying to catch up with ourselves a little bit and make sure that the method is making it all the way through to the archive. So we're explaining how digital maps across onto those CEPA standards. We're providing a little bit of the background of what the standard is, what digital material looks like, and what the content of a digital archive might be. And then we're providing practical guidance, just step-by-step -step information and very simple tools that people can use and start to think about embedding in work processes to help the digital archive make it uh, at the end of the project. So if we think back to that the definition of the process of excavation, why we create archives. It's very similar to the principles that Ed uh, mentioned earlier. It's about re-examination and reinterpretation. We're not creating things and then just walking away. <laughs> We're creating things to be reused and that record um, really vital and important information. This is an extract from the CEPA standard and guidance for archaeological archives. This has not changed <laughs> and this has been the case I mean, this is 2014, but this, the original one was agreed a long time before that, and it hasn't really changed a lot since then. But basically, it's about creating a stable, ordered, accessible archive. What's happened is, I think, as people have developed new methods of doing things, we've, we've retained the way that we archive the physical material, the paper material, and the finds. But we've kind of, we've kind of known <laughs> about the issue of digital, but not really addressed it in a way that means that it's kept in the same manner and acknowledge the fact that not all museums are able to do that. And that's really what the Mendoza review highlighted was that what we need to do is accept and, and remove the burden from museums to actually retain digital archives and say that that digital material can just be archived with a specialist archive that can deal with that amount of data and all the processes that need to be in place to do that. Um, which is why it does need to be treated slightly differently. So when it comes to practice and how we actually embed digital archive practices in our day-to-day -day archaeological work, it's about planning, understanding, <laughs> defining, and documenting what we're doing. And that doesn't just involve your archives officer. <laughs> or the person that's meant to deal with the archive at the end of the project. This is a process that starts when you start your project. It's all about project planning and it's about iterative approaches to project planning. So putting something in a data management plan, which there'll be explanations of, <laughs> and then revisiting it and just keeping all the stakeholders involved in that conversation so that when you get to the end of the project, your, your digital archive is as ready as other aspects of the archive might be and is ready to deposit and doesn't become a burden in itself and therefore not get done. 
Um, it also involves the recognition that this is, has to be actively managed. It's not, it's not uh, an easy process to just start. It's not something that people can just start tomorrow and it'll all be fine. But it is something that once these processes are defined and embedded in day-to-day -day work, that it's just how we do archaeology and how we work with archaeological projects. So, keep calm and make a plan. That's the overriding <laughs> message. That it's, there isn't going to be this expectation that everybody that's working within, um, within the planning environment or within CEPA standards and guidance or the requirements of the project brief overnight has to suddenly become experts in digital archiving. This is something that's a process that needs to be recognised and embedded within day-to-day -day work. I'm going to say that a lot. Um, the data management plan is really the starting point of information that collects and brings together all the different aspects of what digital archiving is. So what kind of data is going to be included in the project? How are you going to create it? How is the data then managed? How is it documented? It's what I do here. Um, any ethical or legal issues around data, such as access rights, copyright, availability, and then how the data will be stored. How does data protection act? Well, that, and that will come into the ethical. So that would be something, even as simple as including the landowner address in a report, or the... Excavator claim. Yeah, it, it's just having gone through that process and thinking about how it's affected so, within the whole system. So some of that needs to be pulled back. So it might need to be redacted or it might need to be withheld for a certain amount of time. Yeah. Um, and then how the data is going to be stored throughout the project, how data selection is going to happen and how it's going to be managed, and that's why it really ties in well with the, data, the selection project, and what the intended archive repository is. And this is what we're talking about today, so how is the data going to be documented? And really, as part of the embedding of a data management plan, it's not just a form to be filled in. And I think a lot of people talk about digital archiving like, oh, it's just something that we need to do and it'll be fine, we just need to fill in some forms. It is actually going to have quite an impact on how different aspects of a project are delivered. So it will take some time for some organisations to get to that point. And other organisations are already flying in and already doing this sort of stuff. But it's just understanding what those processes might be and how we can embed them into each stage of the project rather than waiting to the very end and then realising that it hasn't been costed appropriately <laughs> and it can't then be archived. And I think one of the really telling signs is that when we were, I don't know if we've included it in this, but when we were doing the initial survey for this project, we did a survey called the Start of the Ten, which was just to see what people were thinking about digital archives and, and where people were going for information. And a lot of people have read things like the, the Green Archives book <laughs> that Duncan wrote um, and was updated, and also the Arches Standard. Kind of that, that's kind of well-known and well-embedded. But where it comes to the tools that might help us do digital archiving, such as um, Digital Curation Centre, um, have a data management plan checklist, which is really useful, that's where people kind of stopped. And, and it, it, it was interesting, I think, how much the discussion around what, what you already do within your organisation went from some people who had every aspect of data management kind of covered but then other organisations might do certain things for some projects but not for other projects or they might include certain data standards where it's been requested because of a certain funder, for example, has requested the information. So it's just working out what needs to be done within, a, within an organisation and how that's going to become pretty much a, a, the standard thing that everybody does. Now, the selection toolkit, um, which has recently been launched, Kind of requires a data management plan to be included within the pre um, pre project documentation so WSI for example or your project design would include a data management plan in it and within um, kind of the development world the project brief will require a data management plan to be included in the WSI so there's already triggers that will start to happen and start to become evident within projects but we just need to make sure that we can 
we don't put the cart before the horse because we need to make sure that the costs are in there <laughs> to cover the requirements that we're asking for. Some projects that are getting to those planning stages have already been fully costed, budgets have been set, and, uh, and, and they're the stages of implementation um, in terms of standards and guidance really need to be thought about. And that, that is part of the consultation that's out at the moment, if people have seen that. Um, so this is what a data management plan, these are the headlines that are involved and what's included within, I wouldn't worry about reading all the words, but basically as part of the digital project outputs, there'll be a version of a data management plan which has guidance in each of these sections with uh, what the questions are asking and an example of what a response might look like. Then there's going to be a blank template that people can use or amend <laughs> and make work within the organisation itself. Um, but it does trigger some of those issues. So if you wanted to have a look at how uh, ready an organisation might be for digital archiving, for example, just by opening up a digital management plan and working through each of those sections will help identify some of those areas. And we've also done a self-assessment um, checklist, which has a number of questions like, do you have a... <laughs> don't feel like I deserve that to be honest um, do you have uh, file naming conventions do you use project structured folders um, and, and all of these things if, if there's a no it means you have to think about well, what does that mean for the data management planning side of things and what does that mean for how we can complete this document because it doesn't mean that you have to have all these things in place but basically if you have, it makes life a lot easier because it means it's standardised across an organisation. Each member of the team will know what they're meant to be doing and it will be the same across each of those projects. So what you're tailoring to the project is about the site-specific or the project-specific data and you're not having to reinvent your data management plan every single time you do a project, which will be very tiresome. <laughs> um, so basically, you're planning for these sorts of processes. So when it comes to metadata, you would talk to your repository, which at the moment our choice is pretty much the ADS, but that might change in the future. Oh, and the uh, Historic Environment of Scotland, and also in Wales as well. I think there's, there's moves to have a digital archive in Wales. So work out who the repository will be and find out what the requirements are for metadata, documentation, and also for how um, how that affects the format data and how it's received. So th exactly the same process as you do with physical archives, box sizes, what's written on files, <laughs> all those sorts of things, but for digital data. Um, and then planning it into the project delivery and the processes of the project. Again, if you've gone through that data management planning side, that will trigger some of those processes. Uh, and leaving it through to the archives team is not necessarily the best result, certainly not for the archivist team. I'm looking at Helen because I know that she struggles <laughs> with always being the person that has to solve these problems. But who should own these tasks? So if you're taking digital photos on site, who's downloading them? Who's renaming them? What folder are they being put in? Who's selecting from them? What happens with the working project archive? How does that get into the final project archive? Um, and then how that information is given to whoever's responsible for then depositing it. Um, and that will help map out who's doing what throughout the process. And it should mean that actually when you get to the deposition process, your archives officer might be able to open up a folder and it will already have metadata tables completed within it. Imagine that. <laughs> Just imagine. Um, so this is, this is what ABS looks like, isn't it? <laughs> um, so <laughs> That is the only way that we can meet the um, requirement from CIFA to have a stable, ordered and accessible archive. Now there might be some archives in the future that offer call trust seal, which is what the quality stamp is for this uh, trusted repository, but don't create an accessible archive. So really if there are other archives available in the future, we need to be careful that they're meeting what we need as a profession and that we're retaining that level of accessibility because that's really important for the reusable side of things. 
And there are so many hoops that, <laughs> that digital archives and digital repositories need to go through that it means that um, they are having to maintain a certain level of standard and that as archaeological professionals, we can trust the trusted digital repository to, to maintain our archives in a manner that we would want them to be maintained. Um, so who's kind of needs to think about some of these issues? Again, it's not just about the archives team and the people responsible for archives. This has to come all the way through the project. It's part of the um, management of the project and it's part of the planning of the project at the beginning. And then it, it, it will involve each project team member as it goes from beginning to end. So documentation and metadata needs to be planned into the whole project cycle. Even if you do decide it doesn't get done to the end, it still needs, you know, that discussion has to take place and people need to know that that's the case. Um, those roles need to be identified and embedded and people need to know that that's what's expected of them. So it, like any other training area, making sure that the process document matches the process is um, a good way to start training the team, but also for costing within project delivery and for the archive and making sure that some of those tweaks that need to be made within the process can be delivered and can be done before you say, yes, I'm going to deliver my uh, digital archive and it's going to just cost £50 <laughs> or something. It will cost more than that. Um, so when should the metadata happen? This is something that this guidance is not going to tell anybody because obviously different organisations do things in different ways and where it will make sense to happen will depend on how the organisation is structured, how it works and, and who does what. But there are also, like, this, is, this is kind of, I mean it's pretty colours and lots of circles but I thought it was an easier way to represent it than just a list. But from your data collection down to your selection for the archaeological archive, you go through a number of different steps and at any point within those steps I think you can complete metadata. But it's just at what point you need to complete metadata and what point does it work best for your organisation and your teams and at what point makes the most sense, I guess, across a project. That's my cat. <laughs> um, so, implementing good data management, what we're trying to do is provide information and tools to help people meet the standards that are already in place. So we've got the self-assessment checklist, which triggers questions which will help organisations think about what do we need to do as an organisation in order to, to become uh, digitally archive compliant, I guess. Um, creating action plans to help embed some of those processes within organisations, using data management plans. The project will provide an explanation but also a template that can be used. And then in terms of compliance, there'll be a pathway approach. So this is something that we're discussing at the moment with CIFA. How are we going to check that these things are happening, but make sure that organisations have got time to embed these processes, and that again, it's not just this thing that's instantly expected to happen, because that's not going to work, and it will just fall off. So it's currently under consultation. It's been sent out to um, our Dig Digital Beta Group, which is 185 individuals that responded to an initial survey, but also to all the registered organisations. There's going to be a working document released at the end of June, and then we're going into a kind of an implementation plan where there'll be class training documents, guidance documents, and we'll put all the information up, probably in a format that's very similar to the selection toolkit is now, if you've seen that. So it'll be web-based information that you can just have a look through, uh, pick and choose what you want to use, and download as appropriate. And that's it for me. So now we can get back to the session.